I'm very, very, very happy uh, to have Scott Aronson here. Uh, Scott, thank you so, so much for uh, agreeing to join here today. Um, it's really an honor to have you here. I know that uh, a lot Pleasure. of... Pleasure. Yeah, it's really, really nice. I know that a lot of people in the Forza community are incredibly excited to see you. Um, and so I'm hoping that uh, we'll leave much time for questions. Um, maybe to give people like a very, very quick introduction, we will today be discussing quantum computing Q&A, and we'll discuss, as you probably can imagine, quantum computing and its implications for other crucial technological developments that will shape our future. Uh, and Scott, thanks for joining. I know that you know it's uh, it's it's, it's going to be, I think, quite a quite a wide uh, quite a wide ranging discussion. Hopefully, you are a professor of computer science at the University of Texas, and you're a director of its quantum information uh, center there. And prior to that, you taught electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. And your research interests uh, are quite wide, uh, but I think they really center around the capabilities and limits of quantum computers and computational complexity theory more generally. Maybe we'll get to that too. You have a really formidable blog uh, that I think is familiar to many people here, and it covers a much wider array of future relevant topics. Um, and I will post the link to that blog here as well. And then you also published the really much loved um, quantum computing since Democritus, which gives a great overview of the field. And it starts in the antiquity and then it progresses uh, through logic and set theory, complexity theory, quantum computing, cryptography, uh, to quantum mechanics. And you also make uh, some quite wild speculations about time travel along the way. And perhaps we'll, we'll open up that box of Pandora as well later. Um, but you know, I will only kick off with a few maybe interview questions to warm people up. But this is very much an invitation to everyone who's here uh, to stop me talking. The sooner you ask questions in the chat, preface with a Q, um, the earlier I will start talking. I will stop talking and I will hand over and unmute you to ask your question. So I will, I'm hopefully just going to ask a few warm up questions. Uh, and yeah, I think we can just, uh, we can just take it away and, uh, and, and see how, how quickly we'll, we'll get to questions here. Um, maybe to pick people up it would be fantastic if and i know this is kind of like it could be a very big question but perhaps we can make it we can make it short just to get pe give people get people up to speed um you know would you perhaps mind taking us on like a very quick tour uh, of the history of the field of quantum com computing and um, perhaps why it's exciting and where we are now yeah so uh, I mean, when uh, quantum mechanics was written down, uh, you know, by uh, Heisenberg and Schrodinger and others in the in the mid 1920s, you know, it immediately had this feature that uh, uh, says that that you know, for each particle that you add to a system, uh, uh, you have to multiply uh, the number of parameters that needed to keep track of the state of that system, right? So if I had just a thousand particles, let's say, that could each be spinning up or spinning down, which is just some property a particle could have, uh, then uh, 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 what quantum mechanics has, has unequivocally said from the very beginning is that to keep track of uh, what those particles are doing, I need a, a number, a complex number, uh, which is called an amplitude, for every possible configuration of all thousand of those particles. So what that means is two to the thousand power amplitudes. Okay, so if you, just for a, a thousand particles, which is you know a rather small system, that's already more parameters than you could explicitly write down. You know, if if you use the entire observable universe as as your note paper. Okay, so uh, so so quantum mechanics has had this exponentiality at the core of it uh, from the very beginning. And uh, chemists and physicists knew about this for generations. Uh, I would say that they knew about it mostly as a practical problem, that if you are trying to simulate quantum mechanics on a conventional computer, you know, in all but the very simplest cases, I mean, even just to understand the behavior of a water molecule or, you know, uh, just a, you know, not very complicated, just, you know, let's say, uh, um, you know, a, a relatively small number of uh, uh, interacting electrons and, and nuclei. Uh, well, you know, the number of parameters explodes exponentially with the size of the system. And so, uh, uh, you know, people invented all sorts of clever ways around that problem in special cases. But, you know, in general, 
uh, it was just infeasible to compute the predictions of quantum mechanics in all but the simplest cases. And uh, so it was only, I would say, in the late 70s and early 80s that a few physicists had the remarkable idea of, you know, that if, if nature is giving us this lemon, why don't we make it into lemonade, right? So why don't we build computers that themselves would, you know, operate on quantum mechanical principles uh, that would be built, you know, not out of bits, but out of qubits, you know, that can exist in a superposition of a zero state and a one state. And uh, the crucial uh, thing about that is that if I have, uh, say, n quantum bits, n qubits, then uh, 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 it, to describe their state, if they can interact with each other, I will need an amplitude for uh, all two to the n possible strings of n bits. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, um, it was, uh, I would say, Richard Feynman and David Deutsch are usually considered the first two people to really uh, publicly bang the drum about this idea in the early 80s from, you know, I would say Feynman from a more practical uh, standpoint and Deutsch from a more philosophical one. Uh, and, um, you know, now, now they immediately they faced the question, well, uh, okay, great. Uh, supposing that you built uh, uh, this new kind of computer, this quantum computer, uh, well, what would it be good for? And at that time, they really only had one answer to the question which is that it would be good for simulating quantum mechanics itself. Okay, now um, that, that may sound uh, like a joke or tautological. Uh, the truth is that if and when uh, we, we get uh, really practical quantum computers, I think that is still the most important application of them that we know about, okay, uh, uh, even today. Uh, that is the, 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 at least the economically most important application that we know. Uh, that has, uh, you know, having a general purpose simulator for quantum mechanics uh, could uh, have all sorts of uses uh, for nanotechnology, for, you know, designing new materials, for designing new uh, uh, chemical reactions, uh, uh, designing new drugs, you know, uh, simulating a candidate drug, uh, uh, seeing whether it binds to a receptor in the right way. Um, you know, these are... Uh, uh, big application areas, you know, not things that maybe directly affect, you know, the end user, you know, you, you know, you may not, you know, you may never need a quantum computer, uh, uh, you know, let's say at home for, for checking your email or for, you know, playing angry birds. Okay. But, you know, for quantum simulation, right, these are, these are very significant applications. Okay. But um, I would say that the idea kicked around for a decade or so, and no one really knew what else it was good for besides that. Now, the thing that really made quantum, made quantum computing into a field as opposed to just an idea, you know, and that made people, you know, really get interested in this, you know, let's pursue this, let's see if it can actually be done, uh, was um, a series of, of major theoretical discoveries in the mid-1990s. Okay, and... Uh, uh, the most famous of these uh, was Shor's algorithm. Okay, so uh, Peter Shor, who was uh, at, at that time at Bell Labs, uh, discovered that if you could build a, uh, a truly scalable and programmable quantum computer, well, it would, be, it would be good for something besides just simulating quantum mechanics uh, that, that people actually care about in real life. Namely, it would be good for breaking uh, almost all of the encryption uh, that's currently used to secure the internet, okay? Now, uh, uh, the way that he showed that was he showed that there is a fast quantum algorithm for finding the prime factors of, uh, of enormous composite numbers, okay? And solving a few other problems in uh, number theory uh, uh, and group theory that happen to be the problem that uh, uh, almost all of our public key encryption is based on, okay? RSA, uh, Diffie-Hellman, uh, elliptic curve, crypto, are all based on uh, the belief that certain problems are hard that uh, uh, we learned from Shor's algorithm. If you had a quantum computer, those, those are no longer hard. Okay, now uh, that started a rush to understand, well, you know, what else could quantum computers be good for? Um, you know, it, it's very crucial to understand that in order to, uh, 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 invent his factoring algorithm, Shor had to exploit very, very special properties of the factoring problem. 
Okay, so it does not generalize to solving the NP complete problems, for example. Okay, there are still lots of problems that uh, 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 we thought then, and 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 as far as we know, even today, uh, could still be hard, even for a quantum computer. Okay, but uh, factoring is really really special. Um, after that, uh, another remarkable quantum algorithm was discovered in, uh, in 1995 or six, uh, called Grover's algorithm. Uh, Grover's algorithm gives you some speed up for uh, NP complete problems, including all kinds of problems in um, optimization, machine learning, um, AI. Okay, but unlike Shor's algorithm, it is not an exponential speed up. Okay, Grover's algorithm would give you a more modest speed up. It would solve all these kinds of uh, search problems in roughly the square root of the number of steps that a classical computer would need to solve them. Okay, so it's still very significant, would expand the frontiers of what you can do, uh, but you know, it's, you, know, you can see that for, 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 for the NP-complete problems, we don't know how to get an exponential speed up even with a quantum computer. You know, and I harp on this because I would say that 90% of the popular articles that you'll ever read about quantum computing will give you the opposite impression. Okay, but uh, um, um, no, but okay, so, so it was, uh, uh, you know, so a picture emerged that quantum computers would have, you know, several remarkable applications. Uh, all of them are relatively specialized, or you could say, you know, the huge, you know, the, the, the huger the advantage, usually the more specialized and, you know, and then more modest advantages for broader application areas. So that picture emerged, but then the other question people started asking in the 90s was, could you actually build a scalable quantum computer? And at that time, there were very distinguished physicists and computer scientists who said, this will never be done. You know, this is a theory, it looks nice on paper, but you know, quantum states are very fragile. You're never going to be able to isolate them from their environment you know, well enough to, uh, to actually do a computation of any significant size. You know, now this was a serious objection. I think, you know, but there was a great discovery that changed most people's views. And that was the discovery of quantum error correction and quantum fault tolerance, also in the mid nineties. Okay, and with that said, uh, was that, uh, well, you don't have to get qubits perfectly isolated from the rest of the universe in order to be able to compute with them. You merely need to get them really, really, really well isolated from their environment. Okay, so uh, uh, if you can just um, um, lower the rate of interaction between, you know, your qubits and their environment to a sm small enough amount, then you can use very, very clever quantum versions of error correcting codes uh, to uh, see when your quantum states are leaking into the environment. And when they are, you can detect that in a way that does not destroy the part of the quantum state that you care about only detects if an error happened and corrects the error, okay? And uh, uh, keeps you in what's called an encoded subspace, which in principle would let you do an arbitrarily long quantum computation, okay? So these discoveries really set the agenda of the field for the 25 years since, you know, up to the present. And I would say, you know, since then, you know, we really had two main goals in this field. You know, number one, um, the uh, obvious one, you know, actually build a scalable quantum computer, uh, or at any rate, you know, quantum computers that can do something that is useful, something that usefully outperforms a classical computer, you know, even if it's not yet, you know, truly universal and, and scalable. And, um, you know, and there, you know, the, you know, the biggest prize that, you know, would be to get useful error correction you know, that would let you actually correct the uh, errors in your qubits faster than they're happening. So that, you know, that, you know, once, you know, there's some threshold that you have to get over, you know, it's kind of like the critical mass for a, you know, a bomb, right? Where, you know, when you're below the, the criticality for error correction, then everything you do is going to be a little bit unimpressive, you know, but then when you're beyond that, then in principle, you can scale as far as you want. So, you know, the, so that's been a central engineering task over the last 25 years, you know, and a lot of people, of course, have gotten very impatient, you know, they say, well, it's been decades already, you know, where is the, you know, why can't I buy a quantum computer on Amazon or, you know, or, or at least tap into one. 
you know, but uh, it's it's important to understand that you know uh, this is this is a really really long term effort. I mean, you know, to get from Charles Babbage to the invention, you know, in the 1830s to the invention of the transistor in 1947, that was more than a century, right? So, you know, we would like to do better than that, right? But this is a decades long kind of uh, technological quest. And if you look at the coherence rates, you know, that the experimenters have been able to achieve in the lab, those have just improved by orders of magnitude since they started seriously doing this stuff in the late 90s, which was about when I joined the field. Okay, you know, the, you know, it, it, you know they're, they're, the qubits are not yet good enough to do scalable error correction. Okay, we're not there yet, but they are orders of magnitude better than, than they were. And maybe there are just, you know, uh, two or three more orders of magnitude to go. Okay, unless, you know, there's some, you know, uh, unexpected obstruction along the way, of course. Uh, so, so that's the, you know, the experimental side. Uh, and then people are working on designing better and better error correcting codes, you know, that will let us hopefully build quantum computers, even with noisier qubits. So, you know, you can work at, work at it from that direction as well. And then, you know, I'm on the theoretical side of the field. So what we think about is more, well, supposing that you do get a quantum computer, what is it good for? You know, and what problems are still hard, uh, even if, you know, you have a quantum computer. Uh, you know, how, you know, the entire uh, theory of computation and, you know, complexity theory, uh, cryptography, uh, all, you know, uh, can be generalized to their extended to the quantum setting, uh, you know, and there, you know, there have just been thousands of papers to write, you know, and uh, things to explore there. So, um, you know, I would say that, uh, uh, you know, we have not in the last 25 years, we have not seen uh, another quantum algorithm that was quite as dramatic as Shor's or Grover's. Okay, that's the truth of it. But we have discovered some, some, you know, uh, dozens of more uh, of other very interesting quantum algorithms, and we continue to get a better and better understanding of, you know, the limits of what can be done. And you know, I'm sure that we'll talk more about recent, de more recent developments uh, uh, later. All right, man. Yeah. Uh, honestly, like I, I've been monitoring the questions at the F, so I have been just like kind of like streaming in, all right, and you've all right. tackled, you've at least tackled uh, a few of the questions already. So uh, if if, mm -hmm. if whenever I, I take the participants, if that questions aren't relevant anymore, let me know. But you went mm -hmm. all the way from like simulation, uh, you know, even to yeah. error correction. So let's 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 give it up for uh, Richard Kornbluth with his first question, uh, and I will unmute you now, Richard. Okay. Hi. Hi, thanks, Scott, for uh, coming and talking to us. Uh, before we get too distracted on things like cryptography and whatnot, I've been assuming for a very long period of time that the first useful applications of a quantum computer are going to be in the simulation of chemical or biological processes. And uh, the more I've uh, kind of studied up on this, the more depressed I've gotten, because every time I get to the point of talking about logical qubits and physical qubits, it looks as though the number of physical qubits are required to look yeah. at even something as simple as the excitation of a hydrogen atom by a photon uh -huh. would be enormous. And I guess I, I maybe you could give us a, a, a little better idea. Am I, uh, am I wrong in thinking that if you're going to look at a process that, it, that takes place over time, transient process, Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got a bunch of physical qubits and a bunch, and they they form a bunch of logical qubits. That mapping need not be uh, many to one on a static basis, but that you could reallocate, so to speak, physical qubits among themselves to reform logical qubits as the need arose for that particular part of the computation. Um, okay, so there were a whole bunch of different things <laughs> in that question. And how many so would me, you need? Let me let me let me try to unpack it a little bit. Okay. Uh, so all right. So so first, just the context for people who don't know this is that uh, the um 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 you know a uh, uh, quantum error correction when it was discovered in the mid '90s, you could say that you know in, it it showed that that in principle you know there is no obstruction to building a quantum computer at least based on currently understood laws of physics, right? Uh, um, you know, in, 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 you know and, and in, in, in principle, you know, you know, you just have to get the physical noise rate to be sufficiently low, not zero. 
and then you know you can uh, 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 correct errors you know using some uh, 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 fault tolerance method that will have actually you know a constant overhead or a logarithmic overhead. Okay, so you could say from a, a theoretical point of view, you know the, these these codes are 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 quite efficient. You know the overhead is only by something like an O of one factor. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, as often uh, happens in computer science, uh, uh, um, um, all the uh, uh, practical difficulty comes in what is hidden in that O of one. Okay, and uh, the existing, uh, uh, you know, the, um, um, fault tolerance methods, you know, uh, uh, often require, you know, you know, it, it all depends on what is your physical noise rate and what assumptions are you making about. Uh, uh, you know, what operations you're allowed to apply. But typical estimates would be on the order of hundreds or thousands of physical qubits to encode just a single logical qubit, okay? So if you look at that, that just looks scary, right? You, you know, theoretically, it's a constant, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's no problem, but right, but what, what, that, what, uh, what that would mean is, well, let's say you wanted to use Shor's algorithm to, uh, uh, um, you know, factor a, a 2000 bit integer and thereby, you know, read someone's email. Okay, well, you're not, you know, you're, uh, just 2000 physical qubits will not be nearly enough because, you know, each one will have to be encoded with thousands of, uh, 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 um, each logical qubit will have to be encoded with thousands of physical qubits. So at that point, you would be talking about millions of physical qubits. Okay, and, um, no, you, you you could so so there there are, there are a few ways uh, forward. You know, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you you could you could say, uh, well, uh, you know, maybe we just have to power through. And you know, if 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 someone cares enough about building a quantum computer and is willing to spend enough on it, then uh, you know, maybe they will be able to build devices with millions or or billions of controllable physical qubits. You know, eventually, right? Uh, I love to tell the story of uh, uh, Niels Bohr uh, saying in the 30s that you know, uh, uh, yeah, you know, in, in theory you could build a, a fission bomb, but in practice it will never happen because you know you would have to basically turn an entire country into uranium enrichment facilities, right? It would be an absurdity, right? And then you know, uh, some years, you know, in 1942 or whatever, after he came to the U.S. He saw the Manhattan Project and he said, oh, uh, I see that's exactly what he thought. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, so sometimes even when, you know, uh, a cost is, is, is very high, you know, if someone cares enough, you know, or has a trillion dollars to spend or something, then eventually someone might be willing to pay it. Okay. But the other thing that there are a couple other things that, that, that people are working on. Uh, one of them is, you know, a, as I said before, designing better error correcting codes. Uh, you know that um, um, often uh, error correcting codes will, you know, work better in practice than they can be guaranteed to work in theory. So numerical simulations are very important. I mean, uh, the, the the question specifically was about dynamically reallocating qubits. So, um, uh, I mean, people do all kinds of optimizations, right? They do whatever optimizations they can think of and, you know, and that they could get away with to try to reduce the overhead of these error correcting codes. Um, and um, um, I think that, uh, um, you know, we will, we will have, you know, and, 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 and things like this, you know, dynamic allocation of qubits. Uh, if you look at like what's being done in uh, optical quantum computing, for example, by the uh, Psi Quantum, which is a startup in Palo Alto, it sounds very, uh, it sounds a lot like that. Okay, but you know the 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 overheads are are still very high. But you know if you just if you don't need to protect an arbitrary computation, which is your specific quantum computation, then uh, the overheads can sometimes be better. And you know I think that uh, you know to see let's say the first error correction that gives us a net some net gain, you know that like protects the logical qubits for longer than the physical qubits are staying alive keeps the logical qubits alive for a longer time than the physical qubits would have stayed alive for, right? This is a milestone that people are race, uh, Google and many of the other players are racing toward right now. And I expect that we're going to see that in a matter of years rather than uh, decades. 
Okay, so, um, uh, you know, but, but then to get from useful, you know, error correction in that sense to actually solving, you know, useful problems faster, you know, will, will again be a, a, a quest. Now, now, in terms of the first applications of quantum computers, you mentioned that you were assuming that uh, they would be in chemistry or biology. I think that even before that, we'll see uh, useful quantum simulations for condensed matter physics, right? We're like basically quantum systems where you just have a bunch of interacting sites, a bunch of interacting spins or something, say. and it just directly maps onto the architecture of your quantum computer. Those are probably right. the first things that people will be able to do that will sort of tell them something interesting about physics or about material science that they didn't already know. And one of the main hopes there is that you will be able to achieve some kind of useful advantage in what is called the NISC era. Uh, so NISC was a term uh, coined by the physicist John Preskill, stands for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum Devices. So, uh, so basically this is a buzzword for just like, what advantages will we be able to eke out from quantum computers, let's say within the next decade, you know, mm -hmm. in the era before we have uh, uh, error correction that really works well. Uh, you know, I like to say that, you know, since, you know, the achievement by uh, Google of quantum supremacy this past fall, you know, we've now entered, let's say, the very, very early vacuum tube era of quantum computing. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, before, <laughs> before, before this, we were in the, the Charles Babbage era or something like that. Okay. We are, you know, the transistor era, that would be when there's useful error correction, and that's well ahead of us. Okay. But after decades of effort, I'd say we're finally in the early vacuum tube era where, you know, you have components that are not truly scalable. But, you know, you might, even with little or no error correction, you might be able to do something useful, you know, especially for simulations of condensed matter physics, um, um, simulations of materials, thing, uh, 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 things of that kind, possibly even some simulations of chemistry, if you're really, really lucky, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, people have been, have been working toward that. I mean, in some sense, we already have very special purpose quantum simulators that already do that kind of thing, right? That already do things, you know, that are interesting to physicists and that we don't know how to simulate with any existing classical computer. It's just that most of those systems, we don't call them quantum computers because they're all completely specialized to one purpose, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, what you really want is a programmable device. Yeah. You know, it's like the difference between having to build a wind tunnel versus, you know, having just a programmable computer to simulate airflow, okay? But I think that the degree of programmability of these NIST devices is going to improve over the next decade, and we will start to see sort of, you know, more and more useful in general uh, quantum simulators, even, you know, before we get past this threshold of, you know, error correction and universality, which, of course, is the real goal. And are those actually being? All right. uh, oh, sorry, Richard. Go ahead. I'm Thank really, you. really, I, <laughs> I, I, I really hate to interrupt you, but I'm seeing so many questions yeah. streaming in here that right. I'm getting very nervous. <laughs> Is that okay if we can, if we can yep, take you later on? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Forrest, uh, I'm going to unmute you. Forrest has a question that I think will take us right up to the, <laughs> I think to to the, to the end point of our discussion. All right. Well, uh, I, I honestly wasn't expecting my question to come up. Um, I heard uh, Allison mentioned some things that you were speculating in relation to time travel. I'd always regarded that uh, when you measure a qubit, that it's effectively that that's an irreversible operation. Mm -hmm. uh, computation uh, in the quantum computer uh, is time reversible. I was just really curious to hear more about your thoughts in that space or um, just, just this, this was a novelty to me. So I um, should... All right. Well, these, these are these, 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 these are actually different questions that you uh, were, were, have sort of been munched together. I think. Right. One question is the question of you know are measurements reversible or not. Um, so um, you know in the sort of original Copenhagen formulation of quantum mechanics, they would not be right. A, a measurement is just a, a a primitive of the world that we don't try to analyze in terms of anything deeper, right? It is just, uh, you, know, the, you know, the universe makes a choice 
of, you know, does it want this particle to be spinning up or spinning down? You know, it makes the choice, you know, according to probabilities that we can perfectly well calculate if we know the state of the particle. But once it makes its choice, it then just sticks with it forever. Okay. Uh, now, famously, uh, the, you know, Everett's uh, interpretation, the many worlds interpretation from the 1950s uh, says that uh, in principle, even measurements are, uh, uh, would be reversible because it uh, re-envisions what a measurement means as, uh, as just another, you know, more or less ordinary physical interaction, but one that happens to entangle the quantum state that you're measuring with the degrees of freedom of your measuring apparatus and ultimately with the state of your own brain and with, you know, uh, the environment, you know, all the radiation and air molecules in the room, you know, um, um, Everett says that measurement just means all of those things getting, becoming entangled. Now, you know, in terms of the physics, you know, that is sort of by far the most parsimonious way to look at it. And I think that it is, it is by now sort of uncontroversial that, you know, that measurement should be thought of in that way, okay? The controversial part is that, uh, you know, if you accept that, then, you know, as Everett pointed out, it seems to have the logical uh, implication that measurements would not have only one outcome, okay? That uh, every time, you know, uh, uh, something happens that, you know, that we think of as a measurement in the Copenhagen view, it's really just a branching of the quantum state of the whole universe where, you know, uh, we would just be in one branch that perceives one outcome, but there would also be other branches that would perceive the other outcomes, okay? And uh, uh, there is sort of, you know, in the um, normal sort of evolution equations of quantum mechanics, you know, the Schrodinger equation, there is nothing there that could kill off those other branches, right? If you, you know, you need to insert an extra ingredient if you want to kill the other branches, you know, not if you want them to be there. Okay, so I would say, you know, the, the controversial part is, well, you know, a, a lot of people will agree that, you know, in principle measurements could be reversed if you had, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, alien technology of, you know, of the unimaginably remote future, right? It would be like, imagine what it would take to, you know, uh, reconstitute a burned book from all of the smoke and the ash. Okay, now undoing a quantum measurement would be many, many orders of magnitude harder than, harder than that. Okay, because, you know, any, basically to undo a measurement, uh, anywhere in the entire, you know, universe where, you know, where a record had leaked about what was this qubit a zero or a one, you would have to capture that and undo that. If even a single place remains that remembers whether the qubit was a zero or a one, well, then the measurement has not been undone, okay? But, you know, in principle, with complete control over all the degrees of freedom of a system, you know, you could uh, undo a measurement. Um, you know, and I think people, uh, uh, you know, at, at least people who accept quantum mechanics, who believe that, you know, quantum mechanics is exactly true, that it's not just an approximation to something else, I think that nowadays they pretty much all believe that, that measurements could in principle be undone. Uh, um, you know, not, not everyone uh, uh, likes or will go along with the apparent implication that, you know, uh, uh, before the measurement has been undone, that there could be multiple copies of you or, you know, multiple versions of you with different experiences, you know, and, uh, you know, that, that gets into very hard, you know, metaphysical problems. But, you know, uh, 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 you know you, you, even if it doesn't affect the actual predictions you make. Okay, then, you know, there was the question about, about time travel, which is a different thing, right? Undoing, a, you know, you could perfectly well undo a measurement without, you know, literally like going, get, traveling into the past in the sense of a closed time-like curve or a time machine, right? If I, you know, if I, if I undo something that I, you know, erase something that I wrote, it doesn't mean that I've gone back in time to, you know, it just means that I've erased it. Okay, but, you know, uh, we, uh, physics does not know at present whether true uh, time travel into the past or closed time like curves are possible or not. I would say, you know, that, you know, that is a question to ultimately be answered by a quantum theory of gravity. Uh, and I would say that the 
overwhelming conjecture would be that uh, probably closed time-like curves uh, should not be possible, uh, partly because uh, if they were, then, you know, you've got to deal with all kinds of stuff. You know, you kill your grandfather, you know, therefore you were never born, but therefore you didn't kill your grandfather, you know, you know, you, you know, you all, you know, you, you know, who, who wants to deal with all the, all of those paradoxes, right? So uh, um, now I do have a couple of papers that might have been what Allison was referring to. I have a couple of papers that say, well, suppose that, you know, closed time like curves were, you know, did exist. So that, you know, I'm not really asserting or, you know, uh, or, or even speculating that they do. I'm simply say, saying, suppose that they did and suppose that they, suppose that we modeled them in a certain way, which uh, David Deutsch uh, uh, um, put forward 30 years ago, uh, where sort of nature has to find a consistent evolution around the closed time lake curve, then how would that change uh, the theory of computation? What problems would that let us solve? And the basic picture is that it would enormously enhance our computational abilities, you know, way, way, way beyond what even a, a quantum computer would do. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, so, so, so for example, that really would let you solve NP-complete problems with polynomial resources. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you, you, the way you do it, you know, is, is you would sort of force nature to find a fixed point of a certain evolution. You know, a, a crude analogy that people give is, well, imagine if you could just go back in time and dictate Shakespeare's plays to him, right? And then Shakespeare would say, hey, you know, thank you for saving me a lot of effort, right? You know, here are the plays, these look good, these look like what I wanted to write, so I'll just, you know, publish these. The plays then come down to you, you know, you send them back in time to Shakespeare, right? You know, now notice that unlike with the grandfather paradox, here everything is consistent, right? There's no contradiction anywhere. The only paradox, if you like, is that somehow Hamlet and Macbeth popped into the world without anyone ever doing the work to write them, okay? So, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, that is the kind of thing that you could do in a world with closed time-like curves, it seems. It's just, you know, force some super hard problem to be solved just you know, for the reason that that is the only way to keep the story consistent. And it oh, turns right. out that you could use a similar idea to solve NP complete problems. What we showed in our work is that uh, you could do even more than NP complete problems, what are called P space complete problems. Uh, and this is even if, uh, uh, um, um, you know, the, uh, um, um, if you have a quantum computer, uh, P space is still the limit of what you could do, even with a, uh, even with time travel. So, you know, so we, 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 okay. we sort of worked out the theory of what happened. Okay, I see yeah. in the chat people want to take it back uh, to kind of like near time advances and like, uh, sure. where are we right now? Sure. Where could we be? Uh, thank sure. you so much. I'm uh, taking John Lovell. Um, and next okay. up, John, you are muted now. Let's see if, uh, if, if your question is still relevant. About... John, are you here? Hi. Hi. So I had uh, I had an earlier question on error correction. I think you covered it. Okay. <laughs> so let me ask. Lovely. Oh, yeah. Uh, do, are you familiar with, uh, where do we have it? Are you familiar with the book uh, Quest for the Quantum Computer by um, Julian Brown? And is it worth struggling through the math in the book? Uh, well, that's a popular book. There's not a lot of math in it. Okay, well, there was a lot for me. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, it, it was a popular book that appeared a while ago. I, I read it, I think, I, I don't remember it very well. I, you know, I, I, I think it was, you know, uh, I mean, you know, there, there are more recent ones. Uh, there was uh, Jonathan Dowling, a uh, quantum computing researcher who actually sadly just passed away a few weeks ago. But, he had a book from um, maybe five years ago that was called Schrodinger's Killer App. Um, I have a book, uh, you know, uh, as Alice had mentioned, Quantum Computing Since Democritus, although if the Julian Brown book had too much math, then probably mine would. So, uh, um, okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. No, I mean, I mean, um, um, you know, there are, there are a lot of resources uh, that you can find on the, on the web. I mean, 
There are, you know, undergraduate notes. Um, you know, I actually wrote a couple of things about quantum computing for the New York Times, where I, you know, uh, uh, struggled, you know, back and forth to make it as accessible as possible. And, you know, I mean, like I've been dealing with for 15 years with, you know, journalists who will say, okay, can you explain quantum computing to me in one sentence, right? And, you know, what I tell them is like, after working on this for, you know, 15 years, I can do it in 10 minutes, okay? I can do it in, you know, uh, uh, you know, I can do it in a few paragraphs, right? Well, I think you did uh, a fantastic job in the intro yeah, by yeah, taking yeah. us in the whole I can't field, so. do it in a sentence, right? And if I could do it in a sentence, then, you know, in some sense, it would not be as interesting as it is, right? You know, yeah. if you could sort of shoot, yeah, anyway. Okay, next one up, yeah. we have Alyssa. We're gonna go yeah. really fast here. Uh, 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 hi, Alyssa, by the way. I'm, I'm glad to, see, yeah, happy to see a few familiar faces here, but uh, hi. Thank you, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, so um, back when integrated circuits were discovered uh, in the 60s, uh, yeah. Moore uh, come up with uh, Moore's law, which is, you know, we keep shrinking them and shrinking them and shrinking them. Um, but, you know, you can't shrink them smaller than individual atoms because right. uh, that won't work. Um, so is there a similar limit to the scalability of quantum computers? Like, you know, if we keep making them bigger and bigger and bigger, like, you know, where does it ultimately tap out? Oh, well, I mean, I mean, you, you can't make computers, you know, you can't make computer components smaller and smaller forever. That's true. But you can always keep adding more and more of the components. Right. And, you know, and, and, and indeed, that is exactly what is happening now. Right. I mean, you know, the uh, feature sizes are, uh, you know, are still shrinking a little bit, but, you know, they are no longer shrinking in anything like the Moore's Law way that we were used to from past decades, right? You know, and I think Intel was, you know, trying to get down to, you know, you know, as you get down to 20 nanometers, 10 nanometers, right, then, you know, you, you, you run into a lot of noise and, you know, um, 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 ironically, you know, quantum mechanical noise, right, that, uh, you know, you start having to deal with quantum phenomena, whether you want them or not. Right. And, uh, you know, in, until until you learn to exploit them, you know, they're they're still going to be there, but they're going to be there as a huge nuisance. Uh, um, so but I, I think we, we should say, you know, it should have been obvious to everyone from the beginning that Moore's law is not a law. Right. It is, you know, an observed, you know, technological trend, you know, that has to end after a certain point of time simply because, you know, if it continued for long enough, then yeah, we would get, we would end up with transistors that are smaller than an atom, which, you know, maybe you want to imagine that, okay, but, you know, definitely we're not going to have transistors that are smaller than one Planck length, right, you know, or smaller than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, uh, because, you know, at, at that point, you try to build a transistor like that, and it will uh, uh, exceed its own Schwarzschild radius, which means at that point your computer collapses to a black hole, right? <laughs> Which, uh, um, you know, is uh, uh, sort of nature's way of, you know, telling you not to, not to do something. But, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, the, even, and, and even if, you know, those limits, like the Planck limit, you know, seem rather far off today, well, you know, if you have something, you know, shrinking exponentially, then, you know, unless something stops it, it's going to get there before, before you know, before all that long, right? So, so, um, so yeah, so I think, you know, uh, you know, there's this saying that, like, every exponential that you see in real life, you know, is really just like a, a logistic function in disguise, right? It's, you know, something is going to kick in and stop it. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, there, as far as anyone knows today, you know, there is, there is no limit to how many, you know, memory elements or bits can be connected together in a computer, you know, except for the limits that are imposed by cosmology, you know, by literally the size of the universe, right, which, you know, may impose a limit, which may indeed impose a, a limit on how many bits you could ever have in the memory of a computer. The limit is about 10 to the 122 power. Okay. Oh, if you man. take, you know, if you take a currently uh, 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 accepted cosmology, like uh, the uh, you know, uh, dark energy and, you know, and, and uh, being a cosmological constant. Okay. But, um, 
uh, you know, in, in, in exactly the, an analogous way, you know, there is no known limit to how big you could make a quantum computer. You could keep adding more and more qubits. And again, the only limit that we know is that cosmological one that you're, you're not going to be able to build a quantum computer with more than 10 to the 122 qubits, you know, if you want it to fit within the observable right. universe, right? I mean, you know, you know and, and, and obviously I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying I think we're going to get anywhere close to that limit, uh, but, you know, even just, you know, uh, uh, here in the vicinity of the Earth, you know, there is no known obstruction to building a quantum computer that would have billions of qubits, let's say. Now, you know, what you might have been asking, Alyssa, uh, is, is the question, well, is there going to be some new physics that will kick in? And when you try to build a quantum computer with a billion qubits, then the new physics would say, no, it's actually not a superposition of two to the billion power states, right? Uh, you know, something new takes over that will prevent that from happening. You know, that is what some of the skeptics of quantum computing believe. Okay, but I think what, what's very important to understand is that, well, you know, what, what, what I like to say is that I hope that the skeptics turn out to be right. Uh, you know, that, that building, a, that as you try to build bigger and bigger quantum computers, I hope that some fundamental obstruction would be discovered that would make it impossible. Because if, the, if that happened, that would be a revolution in physics. Okay, that would be a revolution on par with the discovery of quantum mechanics itself. I mean, that is the kind of thing that one lives for in science, right? That would rewrite everything, okay? The idea that you can build a quantum computer of arbitrary size and it will continue working just according to standard linear quantum mechanics, that is the conservative prediction, okay? All right, thank you so much. Yeah. I think we're gonna give it up next to Paul right. to rush sure. through here. <laughs> sure. Sure. Okay, uh, Scott, thanks. Paul here. Um, I know there's a big rush to develop quantum computing, um, and there's a, a conundrum with the cryptographic algorithms. So can you comment on general terms? Is there an equal rush to develop quantum-resistant cryptographic algorithms, or is it how far does it lag yeah. behind, or is it forward? Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think the situation is actually... Uh, pretty good there. It's a lot better than, than many people know that it is. Uh, so, so there is a whole field that has existed for, you know, 20 odd years by now of quantum resistant cryptography or post quantum cryptography. Okay. Uh, that is basically about, you know, how can we design um, uh, crypto systems that will give us all the advantages that we enjoy today from, you know, public key uh, uh, encryption, uh, authentication, uh, Bitcoin, you know, all the rest of it, but in a way that will be resistant against attacks by quantum computers. And for, for that problem, we actually have excellent candidates now for exactly how one could do that. Uh, and so, the, you know, the important thing to understand is that Shor's algorithm, you know, was extremely special to, you know, a, a set of uh, cryptographic codes that we happen to use to secure the internet, right? Namely, the ones that are based on factoring and discrete logarithms and uh, elliptic curve problems, you know, and a few related things. Okay, but these are not the only possible basis for cryptography, okay? They're just a convenient basis that we, that we happen to use. Um, and um, what, you know, people, of course, you know, have put a, a huge amount of thought into figuring out, you know, what exactly is the scope of Shor's algorithm? How far does it generalize? And the basic picture is that there are variants of Shor's algorithm that can tell you almost anything you would like to know about problems involving abelian groups. Okay, so, you know, groups where all the elements commute with each other. Okay, uh, so that includes, you know, discrete logarithms, um, you know, elliptic curve groups are abelian, and so, you know, that uh, those are broken too. Okay, but beyond that, there is a whole realm of candidate crypto systems that are based on other problems, you know, including ones that are based on non-abelian group problems. Okay, and these problems, we generally do not know how to solve them efficiently, even using a quantum computer. Okay, and so all of those problems are, you know, potential candidates for post-quantum encryption. 
Now, um, 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 NIST, you know, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology in the U.S., uh, actually started a competition a few years ago to try to uh, 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 converge on standards for post-quantum encryption. And so that standards process is well underway now. That's sort of the first step to actually, you know, up, you know, getting everyone to upgrade to these systems, which, you know, that could be something that could take like 10 or 20 years, right? Un unfortunately, the way that things actually work on the internet, right, there are people who still use web browsers, you know, that use encryption that was breakable in the 90s, okay? And they just, you know, they just never upgraded, okay? So there's still all this legacy stuff out there when, you know, even after you, you know, in principle, you know how to fix a vulnerability, right, to actually get everyone to use the better thing, you know, can take a long time, and you want to get it right, right? You don't want to open up new security holes as you migrate to something new, which is very, very often happens in, in practice, okay? But what people have converged on, you know, as probably the most promising candidates for post-quantum crypto systems is something that's called lattice-based cryptography, okay? So, so cryptography based on lattices, you know, sets of uh, um, point, uh, like integer linear combinations of points in some very high dimensional space. Um, and we, we, we know how to do public key cryptography based on lattices. In fact, we even know how to do things with lattices that we don't know how to do with uh, the cryptography that we use now. Uh, most famously, fully homomorphic encryption. That is, you know, doing arbitrary computations on encrypted data without ever having to decrypt it. Okay, so lattice-based cryptography, I think, is extremely promising. It's been under development for, for about 20 years by now. And, you know, uh, uh, until, you know, maybe, you know, uh, uh, you know, six or seven years ago, I would say, you know, the conventional wisdom was, well, it's great in theory, but it just, you know, it's too impractical because the key sizes and the message sizes are going to be much, much larger than they would be with our existing codes like RSA. Okay, the lattice-based codes have been improving a lot. And I think that they are now at the point where, you know, they actually could be used in practice. And I believe that Google has actually run a pilot program where like some small percentage of Gmail users had switched them over to uh, lattice-based encryption. And, you know, of course, you know, people need to be uh, pounding as hard as they can on the security of these new things, right? I mean, it's not, so for one thing, it's not that we know that any of these codes are safe against quantum computers, right? For that matter, we don't know that any of them are safe against classical computers, right? We don't know, you know, you know we can't even prove that P is not equal to NP, right? So, you know, we don't, we can't mathematically prove that any of this stuff is secure. Okay, but, you know, we have codes that, we, that, that none of the existing quantum algorithms are able to break. And, you know, and so I think that, um, you know, a, a, a lot more study should be done. So, you know, can quantum algorithms, you know, you know uh, break some of these things after all? So, you know, you know uh, even if the answer is no, you know, the research being done will increase our confidence about it. And also to make these codes more practical, but I think that, you know, people are already uh, uh, thinking about, you know, moving to deploy these codes. And Thanks. so, you know, so, th so there, I think the news is good. Thank you. Okay, yeah. lovely. All right, next one up, we have Christine. Chris, I'm unbeating you. Or am I? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Great. This has been super. So this is a somewhat simpler question, but I know you can also speak at a lower level. Um, you've been using the analogy to say that we are now at the vacuum tube stage of quantum computing. If I'm interested in, in pretty advanced applications, such as you mentioned nanotechnology, Foresight has a special interest in molecular machine systems. Um, I know you said right now we cannot really do a good job of modeling chemical reactions. So if, if we're at the vacuum stage now, vacuum tube uh -huh. stage, uh -huh. what stage would you say we need to be at just in this model of, of theoretical thinking about it to do modeling of molecular mach machine systems and even synthesis of them? And uh -huh. do you have a gut feel for whether we're talking decades or centuries? 
Yeah. So um, um, I I uh, uh, don't make any pr predictions on the mysteries. I don't think you know, except for like very safe ones, like you know, the laws of physics will continue to work or something uh, something like that. Uh, sorry, sorry. It says I'm. Um, uh, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. 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 So I. Uh, uh, I mean, even even to predict on the scale of decades, you know, I, I try to avoid doing it whenever I can. You know, so, you know if, if I had any skill at doing that, I wouldn't be a professor. I would be an investor, right? Uh, but um, uh, what, 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 what one can say, so, you know, you have to, like, separate a, a few different goals, right? Like, I think, you know, like, one, one goal would be just do, you know, learn anything about chemistry, that is interesting to chemists and that we didn't already know using a programmable quantum computer, okay? Now, I think that, you know, if, if all goes well, you know, there is a serious prospect of, you know, being able to do something like that within the next decade, okay? Uh, you know, I mean, in fact, you know, that, that very much is what, you know, groups like, um, you know, Google and IBM and, um, you know, and, and, and Rigetti and Microsoft and all of the others, you know, have been racing to try to do, uh, or, 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 or at least they were before, before COVID shut down the whole world. Okay. Uh, now, you know, uh, um, uh, um, um, most of the experimental work is on hi a hiatus. Okay. But, um, um, you know, I think that, that like, like uh, if, 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 if your definition of success is just find one thing that you can do, where you know you couldn't get the answer with a classical supercomputer, you know about what is the rate of this chemical reaction, and you can get it with your quantum device, and you know, uh, 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 and and it's interesting to chemists. Then uh, I think that it is realistic to hope that one may be able to do that even before one has full quantum error correction. So you know that would mean uh, you know in my analogy when we're still in the vacuum tube you know we're in the sort of the pre-transistor stage of quantum computing you know and you know it's it's very you know uh, it's it's very hard to to predict numbers of years you know but what 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 I can tell you is that when the experimentalists you know I I now you know even though I started on the sort of the theoretical end of the field you know I now do interact a lot with experimentalists. Uh, for example, uh, with the ones at Google who did this quantum supremacy experiment. Okay, and so I see, like, they tell me, like, we are doing this, ex you know, we're building this device, and it's, it's everything's going well, and we're going to have data in six months, and it's no problem. When they've told me that, I would say usually within four or five years, it, it has worked. Okay, so, so in other words, you know, whatever number the experimentalists tell me, I have to multiply it by some factor, maybe between five and 10, but the factor has not been infinity, okay? And what the experimentalists are talking about now is, you know, building useful, you know, programmable quantum simulators within the space of a few more years, okay? So you can apply my rule to that, you know, as, as you like, okay? And then, you know, of, of course, you know, the real uh, dream of, of everyone in the field is to get, you know, error correction, uh, which would be, you know, like the quantum computing version of the transistor, you know, or like the thing that would sort of move us to the beginning of the transistor era, in my analogy. Um, I wouldn't want to have to make a forecast for when that's going to happen. Um, you know, I think that we are very, very obviously and measurably closer to it than we were, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. Thank you, Scott. This is fantastic. Yeah. I know we're now at noon. I have a lot more questions. Do you have a few minutes or do you have yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> this could go on up infinitely. Could, Sometimes people could. stay on for two and a half hours. So just whenever you have to hop off, just tell All me. Right. But so, 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 I mean, what, what, what should we say? Should we say like another half hour or so? Is that, you know? If you're okay. willing to let's, 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 the let's, time. Let's, 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 let's do another half hour and then I'll, uh, I'll go. Thank you the, so the, much. It's much appreciated. To people with, uh, To help with the kids. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. Yeah. It's much appreciated. People in the sure. chat are getting no yeah, no problem. very no beep, problem. beep, beep. Okay. Dan Gershevich, I'm unmuting you next. And you have two uh, aliases here. I think so. I'm going to just try to do both of them. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Scott. Uh, thanks Hi. for doing this. Yeah. Um, 
I had two questions. I'll just uh, skip to the second. Mm -hmm. um, Wolfram put out a, a new model, and it's a yeah. slight tweak on his old model, which you mm -hmm. kind of famously found some issues with re uh, regarding Bell's theorem and mm -hmm. special relativity. Um, in the new model, there's a prediction that BQP equals P. I'm not sure if you saw that. Maybe you can talk about I, whether that's so, so I saw it. So I did testable. say it, but it, it is totally unclear to me that you know that that uh, they are actually making that prediction because they're very very vague in their use of language. Okay, they're they're saying that the, you know uh, you know BQP is a mathematically defined complexity class, right? The question you know is it's the class of all the problems that you could efficiently solve. With an idealized quantum computer, okay. The question of you know does that equal p in class that you could efficiently solve with a classical computer, you know that is a mathematical question, right? It has no dependence on physics, right? It's a, you know it's just it's just like the Riemann hypothesis, you know, is a, a math problem, okay? But you know when they say that bqp equals p, you know that you know that that is not what they mean, okay? They seem to mean that you know that you know, they think that the real universe does not exactly obey quantum mechanics, but it obeys some other rules that could be simulated in P. Um, unfortunately, you know, the, the problem with saying things like this, you know, and Wolfram said something similar in his book in 2002, in his new kind of science book. Uh, the problem is, well, then how do you account for all of the, you know, known quantum phenomena, right? With the, you know, the sort of, fact that our world seems, you know, manifestly to be quantum and, you know, forget about something speculative like a scalable quantum computer, right? Just take the well-known quantum phenomena, like the violation of the Bell inequality, okay? You know, that proves that, you know, there is really such a thing as entanglement between two separated particles, right? And that has been experimentally confirmed starting in the 1980s. And then a few years ago, it's been confirmed in a way that closes, I would say, every po conceivable sane loophole that you could, you know, possibly imagine, right? Simultaneously in the same experiment, right? So we know, you know, um, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, unless the entire universe is an illusion or a lie, you know, we know that entanglement is real, right? And we know that the state of the universe, you know, uh, 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 you know, is not a classical state. It is not like a classical cellular automaton, right? It has entanglement between, you know, distant particles. And you have to account for that, you know, for your theory to be taken seriously. There is no wiggle room. There is no way around that, okay? And what Wolfram did in his book in 2002 is he said, well, uh, uh, okay, you know, uh, we could account for that if we just imagine that within this cell classical cellular automaton, that you know underlies physics. There are a few little long-range threads here and there. You know when some particles become you know entangled. And you know what I tried to you know explain exhaustively you know in this review that I that I wrote you know uh, I guess uh, half of my life ago uh, was no that still doesn't work uh, uh, because you know we, you 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 posit these long-range threads and then information could get transmitted faster than light. Right, quantum mechanics is this incredibly delicately balanced structure, you know, that allows for entanglement, that allows for violation of the Bell inequality, which is this experimental signature, you know, proof of entanglement. Okay, but it still does not let you send information faster than light. Okay, so it still upholds, you know, the Einstein speed limit on, you know, on sending a, a, a message. And you know, when you, if you try to uh, replace quantum mechanics with something else, then what you typically find is that if you want to recover the phenomena, like, you know, the Bell inequality violation, then the only way to do it is if you can send messages faster than light, okay? And that is exactly what does happen in Wolfram's model. And, you know, and I proved that as a theorem, okay? And, uh, uh, you know, I didn't, I just put this in the book review because I thought this was kind of obvious. But, you know, a few years later, um, John Conway and Simon Koshin wrote a paper called the free will theorem that uh, um, became kind of famous that, you know, made basically the same point that was in this book review. But, you know, I didn't think <clears> to <throat> give it that name. Though. They, 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 had, the, like, they had a better name the, for it. Okay. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the situation, you know, I, I read uh, uh, Wolfram's newer thing that he put out a couple of months ago, 
Uh, I've been, I was meaning to write a blog post about it. I never got around to it. Um, as far as I'm, as far as I can tell, the situation has not changed appreciably. Like they want to explain quantum, you know, phenomena with sort of an underlying model that looks like a classical one. Uh, but you know, and, and then and then they they sort of, you know, in a in an ad hoc way, they sort of graft particular aspects of quantum mechanics onto their model. Uh, like they say, oh well, well, okay, you want interference, you want amplitudes. Well, we could get that by just you know, attaching some complex phases onto, you know, the different paths that our model could follow. So, you know, uh, which, okay, you could do that. But the problems are, number one, you know, in no sense whatsoever have they derived quantum mechanics or explained quantum mechanics, right? At, at the very most, they can just sort of graft it on, right? And while trying to hide the fact that they're doing that, okay? And but then secondly, they say all kinds of things, you know, that I, I cannot map at all to my understanding of quantum mechanics. Okay, they talk about, you know, entanglement between the different worlds and this is right, which entanglement is not a thing that happens between different worlds. It's a thing that happens between different locations in a world, right? So, you know, they, they use words in a way that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, they, um, you know, they, 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 they claim that they can recover quantum mechanics, but they don't, uh, uh, you know, they don't explain, like, what is the Hilbert space? You know, like, what is the space of states? Uh, they don't explain how do they get the Born rule? So how do they get the probabilities? Where does that come from? You know, they, 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 like, they don't even perceive that it's a problem, that they, that they should explain these things, right? And so I would say long before we get into the debate about, well, you know, uh, does their model predict that a quantum computer can be built or can't be built? Let me see how their model explains the Bell inequality, right? Let me see their model explain the simple stuff that we already know, because I haven't seen that. Okay, thank you so much. Next yeah. one up, we have Creon. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Scott. Great, hi. To, great to hear from you again. Um, yeah. So I have a question that is maybe more of a physics question than a math or computer science question, but I suspect you're quite qualified to answer this, or at least riff on it. And that's the following. Going back to the sort of killer app of, you know, a quantum molecular simulation. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. So, and which was Feynman's original inspiration in a way. Okay, so um, we have things like the helium atom and more complicated molecules, and they, if you want to view them as doing a computation, they do it without error and without a bunch of error correction bits, like the mm -hmm. like poly electron molecule yeah. computes the correct energy for dissipation yeah. or whatever yeah. without a bunch of millions of error correction bits and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so what I'm wondering is, A, does that give us any insight into potential approaches to quantum computing that are not um, the, the sort of uh, uh, popular ones right now mm -hmm. uh, or any insight into the nature of quantum computing or the nature of reality mm -hmm. that somehow mm -hmm. these very simple yeah. real systems do what we believe a really complicated quantum yeah. computer may be able to do. Yeah. Are we barking yeah. up the wrong tree and, yeah. or is there some way to make a quantum computer even a special purpose one that might be based on these more physical uh, principles taken from nature rather than principles taken from computer science like qubits. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So, you know, uh, my, my friend, uh, Zach Wienersmith, who writes the uh, SMBC comics, uh, you know, a web comic strip, he has this great cartoon that I love where someone is saying, I hold in my hand the universe's ultimate computer for simulating a hunk of cheese. You know, and of course it is a hunk of cheese, right? So, you know, you know, so yeah, so every physical system is you know a, a perfect computer for the specific problem of simulating itself, right? This is true for both classical you know physical systems and for quantum ones. Uh, but we don't you know we don't usually you know we're we're not usually in the habit of just pointing to any you know random item on my desk and you know calling it a computer to simulate itself, right? Uh, because you know the you know usually when we use the word computer. You know, it's, I guess, some, at least some degree of programmability, right? Uh, or some ability to model something other than itself, you know, right? So, you know, the, the way that I like to put it is that, you know, for something to, for a physical object to count as a computer, you know, it ought to be at least logically possible, 
for it to output a wrong answer. Well, so, okay, I, I hear you. So in I other hear... words, you know, there ought to be some external standard of, you know, right, you know, of correctness by which you can judge, you know, what it's doing, right? You know, it, it, you know is it correctly solving the problem that you gave to it? You know, which means that there has to be some notion of giving the, you know, uh, object a problem to solve other than the tautological problem of just simulate yourself, which every physical object always solves perfectly, right? Yes, yes, so, indeed. But one could imagine some so, sort of isomorphism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, one yeah, could, yeah fine, one fine, could imagine fine, an fine. isomorphism. I, I, I understand all of that, okay? So, uh, you know, now, now, of course, you know, you could look at the existing uh, quantum error correction, you know, uh, codes and say, well, maybe, you know, all of this overhead is, is, uh, 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 you know, is, is not needed. Uh, you know, even if we, you know, assuming that we want a fully programmable quantum computer, you know, analogous to how we have fully programmable classical computers, uh, you know, even if you, you want that, you know, maybe there is a way to do it where the error correction would be, you know, sort of naturally built in and would not have to be sort of uh, 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 explicitly uh, achieved, you know, via uh, complicated coding or software. Uh, that would be great. And, you know, and there actually is an idea that is very much in that direction, which is called topological quantum computing, right? And this was an amazing idea that was uh, uh, originated with the uh, work of Alexei Kataev and others about 20 years ago. And basically what they showed is that um, if you um, uh, uh, um, um, could create a uh, uh, well a new type of particle uh, a type of um, excitation uh, which has never been seen in nature okay but which you know in principle should be possible so some uh, uh, quasi particle excitation in a two dimensional medium uh, which is called a non abelian anion okay so it's it would be a particle a quasi particle that would behave neither as a boson nor as a fermion but with some more complicated statistics then just by braiding these uh, uh, anionic particles around each other in an appropriate pattern, uh, you could do a universal quantum computation, okay? And now the key point is that in order to cause an error in the quantum computation, uh, you would actually have to change the topology of how the particles are braided around each other, right? Uh, you know, a local error that doesn't change the topology will have no effect on the computation. Okay, so this... Um, is, uh, you know, it's a, uh, um, um, an incredible idea. Uh, you know, it, it could mass, it, you know, it probably wouldn't eliminate the need for a fault tolerance entirely, but it's believed that if this worked, it would greatly reduce the need for fault tolerance, okay, by, you know, by exploiting the physics of this exotic physical system, you know, in exactly uh, the way that you said. Uh, you know, the one problem is that to make this work, you need to, uh, create this new state of matter that's never been seen in nature. Okay, now, um, you know, among all of the quantum computing efforts, Microsoft is the one that has placed a huge bet on this topological approach, okay? And, you know, they are trying to, right, you know, have been trying for five or 10 years now just, just to, you know, um, create a few non-abelian anions and then prove that they did that. Um, you know, it looks like they can create something called a Majorana fermion, fermion, which, you know, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately is not yet good enough for quantum computation. Uh, but, um, you know, I would say like, like if, if, if you think of it as a horse race, like, you know, the superconducting approach to quantum computing, which is what uh, Google and IBM and uh, Rigetti and a bunch of others are pursuing, that is now at about 50 or so programmable qubits. You know, not not great qubits, but you know, good enough to you know achieve this quantum supremacy and you know do a solve an artificial problem that seems to be hard for a classical computer, right? That's where we are now. Okay, with that, uh, topological quantum computing right now is at zero qubits. Okay, it is trying to get to one qubit. Okay, but you know, if it worked at all, then you know, I mean, the reason why people are so remain so excited about it despite that is that if it works at all then it looks like it could greatly reduce uh the overhead of, of error correction so i think that you know uh well, you know um, um absolutely 
you know, that's great. And it would be great if someone discovered something else that had that uh, similar property as that. Okay, but you know, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the the pe people use the analogy that you know, uh, uh, you know, the whole theory of quantum error correction, right, is a lot like something that John von Neumann discovered in the 1950s, which is that you know he discovered that you could build uh, and do an arbitrary, arbitrarily long, reliable classical computation, even using unreliable vacuum tubes. Okay, and you know, he proved a beautiful fault classical fault tolerance theorem that said that. And then that theorem ended up mostly not being needed because transistors became so reliable that, you know, they pretty much only fail when a cosmic ray hits them. You know, so, you know, you, you know your, your computer will suffer a cosmic ray error maybe about once per year on average. Okay, and that's All right. It, right. So it would be great to have some naturally natural quantum computing component, like, a, you know, a transistor, maybe topological quantum computing could someday do that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Next one up, we have Glenn. Hey, Scott. So I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to ask you this. So I uh, contribute to Bitcoin. Uh, mm -hmm. So asking for wild speculation, I am asking yeah. sort of the, the timeline question, which is yeah. like, Specifically as to the elliptic curve discrete log problem yep. uh, on our group, uh, what do you mm -hmm. think the timeline is? When should we worry? Uh, well, okay. As I said, you know, I don't. Um, um, I, I I hate having to forecast timelines, but you know, the the important thing to understand to 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 think about the question is that cryptography is not going to be threatened until there is a you know a fault tolerant scalable quantum computer. Right. So basically, you know, sh uh, like running Shor's algorithm to break, you know, elliptic curve cryptography, that is one of the harder things that you could imagine doing, you know, with a quantum computer from an engineering standpoint. And in fact, at the point where you can do that, you can probably just do any quantum computation that you want. OK, so, you know, it is, it is not much easier than just doing any quantum computation at all. OK, so. Um, so, so that, you know, uh, so, 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 so crypto, you know, is, is, is almost certainly safe until you get past the threshold of fault tolerance, which, you know, I would be very surprised if that happened in, in less than a decade. You know, I don't know beyond that. I don't know. You know, I don't even know how much longer civilization will continue, right? I mean, you know, when I, 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 I read the news these days and I feel like we might only have a few more months. OK, so so, you know, I mean, that, you know, like, like, you know, you go beyond a decade and I start getting into civilization level uncertainty. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the you know, if, if there is urgency uh, about about crypto and about Bitcoin, I mean, I think part of it is, is just that, uh, well, you know, some people have secrets that they would like to keep secret for 20 years. Right. And it would be safe to assume that NSA and GCHQ and so forth are, you know, even now vacuuming up, you know, all the data that they can't currently decrypt, you know, in the hope that they will be able to decrypt it later, you know, with a quantum computer or with something else. So if that's already of concern to you, well, then maybe one should start switching to quantum resistant crypto already. Okay, but now, uh, with, with in the specific case of Bitcoin, you know, there have been some really nice analyses of the quantum resistance of Bitcoin that were done recently. And the basic picture is that the blockchain part of, of, of you know, of, of Bitcoin, like, let's say, stealing someone's money, you know, that's been on the blockchain for a while, right? That, I mean, you know, or, or, uh, or, or um, you know, spoofing the proof of work algorithm, right? you know, uh, inverting the hash function, these basically require breaking private key cryptography, right? A quantum computer will only give you the Grover speed up that is only, you know, we think only like a square root speed up from Grover's yeah. algorithm. And that could be mitigated against by basically just doubling the key length. Yeah, regrettably. Uh, you know, the, 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 the part of Bitcoin that is vulnerable is the part that involves uh, signatures that are based on elliptic curve crypto where there's like a brief window of time uh, uh, in, in the Bitcoin protocol where, you know, someone would be vulnerable. So you would need a really, really fast quantum computer that could actually break the elliptic curve crypto within that time window. 
maybe eventually that would be possible. But you know, in any case, if one is worried about that, then one could one could you know, in principle, it would be easy to migrate that part of Bitcoin to you know instead of using elliptic curve crypto to use lattice crypto. For example. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not worried about the Grover speed up. Regrettably, yeah. it turns out a coworker yeah. of mine did a yeah, did yeah. proofs for the quantity of bitcoins where the public key is is known or disclosed. And unfortunately, yeah, yeah, yeah that, no, that's right, that's right. No, we're 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 we're, we're talking. You know, I'm I'm not an expert on Bitcoin to you know address this in detail, but I, but it sounds like we're talking about the same thing. But you know, but the, the short answer to your question is, I don't think there's you know an attack anytime soon. You know, uh, 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 definitely not in the as you know in the in the you know as far as I can foresee into you know the coming you know five or ten years. Uh, and um, you know, but but if if you know you know further out, you know, one can't say it's impossible. And you know, there may you know if I mean I mean I mean you know one 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 is probably a fairly paranoid person if one is using cryptocurrency in the first place, right? So <laughs> you know, maybe maybe one should already start worrying and planning. This. Says the one who gives civilization a few months to live. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Next one up, we have Neil. Neil, I'm unmuting you now. Um, let's see. Wow. Thanks. Uh, exciting to get a question, and I, I also didn't expect to get it. So you had a quote in um, one of your books, that fabulous article on like the philosophy of uh, Democritus and so on, on um, comparing the um, probability model that is conventional with kind of quantum probabilities where there's a two, I, I'm sorry, I wrote it in my question, but I, I don't have it in front of me. But you probably know the quote I'm talking about. The one norm? Yeah, yeah, two norm. Can you give a, a little more kind of sense about what those two kinds of probability are like or, you know, expand on that? Yeah, so okay, what, what, I, what I like to say is that quantum mechanics is actually a, a lot simpler than, you know, people have been led to believe uh, once you take the physics out of it, okay? Uh, so, you know, uh, the way that we think about it in quantum information is that it's a certain generalization of the rules of probability themselves. Uh, and, you know, the, the sort of the central feature of quantum mechanics or the way that it differs uh, from you know, a classical picture of the world is not in the use of probability, right? Even long before quantum mechanics, people described their uncertainty using probabilities. They would say that there's a 30% chance of rain tomorrow or something. But what they would never say is there's a negative 30% chance of rain tomorrow, right? Much less would they say that there's an I percent chance or, you know, a complex number chance of rain tomorrow, right? That just wouldn't make any sense. Um, so, you know, uh, what, what quantum mechanics says is that, well, we're still, you know, we're going to describe the world with probabilities, but the way that we cal have to calculate the probabilities is completely different from what, you know, you would have intuitively expected. Uh, and we have to calculate probabilities using a different kind of number called amplitudes. Okay, and amplitudes can be positive or negative, and they can even be complex numbers. Okay, and to every possible configuration that a physical system could be in, that you could find it in on, on looking at it, uh, you have to uh, assign an amplitude, okay? And, you know, the, the main way that quantum mechanics leads to phenomena that, you know, differ from those of classical physics is that these amplitudes can interfere with each other. They can cancel each other out. So like, if I wanna know the total amplitude for a thing to happen, like for um, a photon to hit a certain spot on a screen, I have to add up a, a contribution from every possible way that that thing could have happened, like every path that the photon could have taken to get to that point. And now if one of those paths contributes a positive amplitude and another path contributes a negative amplitude, for example, then the two contributions can interfere destructively and cancel each other out with the result being that the total amplitude is zero, right? And then the other rule, uh, central rule, is that, is that when you look, then, you know, the, the, the superposition involving all these different amplitudes um, just becomes, 
you know, uh, uh, um, one outcome, okay, and the probability that you see a single outcome, you know, that you see a, a given outcome is equal to the squared absolute value of its amplitude, okay? So, uh, um, um, you know, so, 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 so in the end, we, 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 we do deal with probabilities, but we have to calculate the probabilities as the squared absolute values of amplitudes, where these amplitudes are complex numbers that we get by adding up a bunch of other complex numbers. Okay, this is this you know th 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 that was my two-minute summary of what quantum mechanics says. Right, everything else about quantum mechanics is just more and more applications and instances of that of that one thing. You know, this uh, replacement of probabilities by amplitudes. Okay, and, and now what about the two norm? Well, the two norm comes in because we say, um, you know, if, if I had a bunch of probabilities, then they have to add up to one, right? If, if these are for a complete set of mutually exclusive outcomes, right, you know, probabilities have to add up to 100%, just, just, just to make sense. Okay, well, um, you know, th th that's still true in quantum mechanics, but now we would say that the sum of the squared absolute values of the amplitudes has to add up to one, okay? Which means that if I think of the amplitudes as a vector, that it has to be a unit vector. So in other words, a vector of length one, just because of the, by the Pythagorean theorem, right? So it has to be a vector, you know, uh, whose, whose two norm is equal to one, okay? And then, you know, the, the Schrodinger equation, the central equation of quantum mechanics, this says that the way that the, a, a physical system evolves, if you're not looking at it, is that, you know, this vector that represents the state, you know, of, of your system uh, evolves linearly in time. So it just rotates around and around in configuration space in some way that preserves its two norm. Okay. And, you know, and the evolution had better preserve the two norm because if it didn't, then the probabilities would stop adding up to one. Right. So, you know, now, now, you know, this might sound a little bit arbitrary, but, you know, to a mathematician, I mean, the Pythagorean theorem is pretty basic, right? The two norm is a pretty basic aspect of reality. And, you know, in fact, like if you had asked a mathematician, like in the 1800s, like make up a theory that is like probability, but that involves complex numbers, right? Uh, you know, uh, um, and it's based on the two norm instead of on the one norm. I think that even with zero experimental input, you know, if they succeeded at all, they would have been basically forced to invent quantum mechanics. Okay, that is basically the unique way of, of doing this. And, okay, I think yeah. Harrison had a follow-up directly. Okay, to that. all right, fine, We're now fine. at 29, so yeah, yeah, that fine, could be fine. the last right, so, question. So, so, so let's do one last question then. Yeah, Harrison, you had a follow-up. Yeah. Uh, hi, Scott. Uh, it's, hi. Uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, so when, when, when I first encountered your concept uh, of the sort of analogy of amplitude probability um, in that approach, my immediate sort of question was, well, what's the notion of a conditional amplitude, like a conditional probability? And yeah. I spent a couple hours trying to answer this question and couldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but obviously, I know uh, mm -hmm. almost nothing compared to you. Yeah. So, so uh, if you could if you could speak to that, and then maybe mm -hmm. also speak to it, it, in Everett's um, idea of you know. Uh, uh, measurement is just entanglement. Uh, yeah. This this this, this born probability thing, where you where you take the the norm of yeah. your, the square norm of your of your amplitude, seems super weird. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. like how do you get slotted into a universe based on your yeah. subjective understanding? Yeah. Yeah. Metaphysically, well, maybe you can say something intelligent right. about that because I find all right, it. all right. Well, your 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 second question has been like the biggest debate about the Everett interpretation since it was proposed, you know, sixty plus years ago. Okay, so I'm probably not going to resolve that debate in the you know minute or two that I have. I mean, basically, you know, if you know th that is kind of the central metaphysical weirdness that Everett asks you to swallow, right? That you know there is some notion of you know world mass or you know soul mass or something right that you know you get go into a particular you know you experience a particular branch with probability that squares like the absolute square of its amplitude right you can give all sorts of justifications for you know how you know once you assume the unitary part of quantum mechanics then um you know there's basically no other probability rule that would make mathematical sense 
other than the absolute squaring rule, right? But that's because the unitary part of quantum mechanics kind of already presupposes that you're conserving the two norm, right? It already picks out the two norm as special, if you like, right? Um, but so, you know, you can give, you know, there are like, you know, 10, 20 different arguments in the literature for why the Born rule, you know, why, why that probability rule is the only choice that makes sense. Uh, you know, each one involves some assumption that you'll have to make, right? And then it derives the Born rule from that assumption. Okay, but so so you can say, you know, if you were going to impose a probability rule, then it's kind of a, a forced choice. But, you know, why should probability have entered at all, right? You know, why, uh, uh, why, why, why should you be able to think about, you know, these different future versions of yourself as if, you know, you're going to be one of them, you know, just sort of drawn at random from some distribution, right? These are, these are very hard questions that I'm not, I apologize, I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer for you. Okay, now your first question uh, was about, can, is there a notion of conditional amplitude? So, so there is. Uh, you could just take, you know, uh, so 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 often the, the way that we calculate the amplitude of a path is by multiplying the amplitudes for all of the sort of choices that are made along that path, right? Just like with probabilities, really, right? Where we can multiply the probabilities of a whole bunch of independent events, like coin flips, right? And then a conditional amplitude could just be, you know, a uh, um, like well, like one such uh, amplitude divided by another one. Right. So, you know, so I, so I could perfectly well talk about like, you know, the 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 a transition amplitude from one state to another one. OK. And, you know, a, a, as long as there's no interference, then that will be the say that transition amplitude will be the same thing as like the total amplitude for the first uh, n choices divided by the total amplitude for the first n minus one choices. Right, sure, and that'll be like, like the tr transition amplitude for choice n. Okay, but you have to be really careful because you know they, there are some quantum generalizations of Bayes theorem and Bayesian conditioning, and there's even you know notions of conditional quantum states, but they're a little bit subtle because you know classically what you condition on is an event, right? But you know in, in quantum mechanics, there's not really the same notion of an event that is just a thing that you can condition on, you know, whether anyone looked or not, right? In quantum mechanics, you have to either make a measurement or not make a measurement, okay? If you make a measurement, then you get to condition on the outcome of the measurement, but also making the measurement changes the state of your system, okay? So, you know, but, but modulo that, you know, you can Google for it, right? There are uh, papers that talk about how to make sense of Bayes theorem and conditioning and all of these things in a quantum context. Uh, the work of Chris Fuchs, for example, uh, would be would be a good place to start. All right, F hey, F U C H S. Yeah. Okay, right. we're now uh, we're now yeah. it's four minutes over the overtime. All right, and well, uh, I think Alyssa mentioned earlier here yeah. maybe we can uh, you know I, I will contact you very very politely again and uh, mm -hmm. quiz you if you may want to come back at a future given point i'm sure that there's a lot a, a lot more questions now actually than yeah. we were going into and i'm sure you have a lot more too um so for now i just really really want to thank you for your time i know this has been yeah. totally fantastic and much much yeah. much much uh, sure. appreciated by this community and sure. i'll be maybe in, uh, in in contact with you and for now i'm going to open up breakout rooms for those who still want to continue the discussion right. and hey i really from the bottom of my heart thank you so much for joining right. i know well, that i you. see many very smiley happy faces here in All the right. audience well, thanks. thank you <laughs> Thanks for Thank having me. Thank you so me. much, guys. Yeah, okay, up to the right. next one. I'm going to open up breakout rooms now. Okay, all right. We'll see you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. -bye. Okay, bye.